Today we're going to be talking about thermodynamic cycles. As you know, gas can do work. And the work that can be done is just equal to the integral of PdV, which is to say the integral of the pressure as you change the volume in a system. And we can work this out for an ideal gas. And in an ideal gas, we know that PV is equal to nRT, where P is the pressure, V is the volume, N is the number of moles, R is the ideal gas constant, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. And it's very important to remember that it's in Kelvin. And this whole equation, PV is equal to nRT, is something called the equation of state of the gas. And the reason that it's called the equation of state is that it relates all of the thermodynamic properties that we can measure, which is to say the pressure, the volume, and the temperature uh, together. And as long as we know the number of moles in the gas, and we know at least two of those quantities, pressure, volume, and temperature, we can, uh, we can do something really, really interesting. We can, we can learn everything we want to know about this system. So let's get started. The specific thermodynamic cycle that we're going to work through today is called the Carnot cycle. And we can draw this using what's called a PV diagram, where the y-axis is pressure and the x-axis is volume. And so if we choose some point in this PV diagram, then since we know the ideal gas law, again, PV is equal to nRT, you know, for a given quantity of gas, if we know the pressure and the volume, then we know the temperature of the gas. Because, again, PV, we are known, N is known, and so we can calculate T from that. And furthermore, uh, as we travel through this PV diagram, so if you take some, your quantity of gas that's at its original point and move it through the PV diagram, say, down in this direction, over to here, to a new pressure, and a new volume, then it is going to possibly change its temperature as you move from your initial pressure and volume to your new pressure and volume. Not necessarily, but maybe. And we can figure out for a given path through this system, from here to here, say, how much work is done by using that equation that we talked about la uh, on the past last slide, which is the work is equal to the integral of PdV. And we can go ahead and use this uh, equation of state to relate those things. And before we set up the Carnot cycle, I need to remind you about isothermal gas. So sometimes when we travel through this PV diagram, we can do so in a way such that the temperature is equal to a constant. And here I've shown two isotherms, one that I'm calling T hot, where it's some warm temperature, and one that I'm calling T cold, which is some colder temperature. And in an isothermal gas, uh, as you might guess from the name, the temperature is equal to a constant. So we know that P is equal to nRT over V. And so another way to say this is that P is proportional to 1 over the volume of the system. So now let's set up the Carnot cycle. It looks like this. We start out at some initial pressure and some initial volume. Right here. And then what we do is proceed from what I'm going to call point one down along this isotherm to another point. So we're going to increase volume while keeping a constant temperature, which means that the pressure is going to go down. And let's just call this part A of the cycle. And this is an isothermal process. And we can calculate the work. We're going to call that, this is going to be P1 and V1. And of course, it has a temperature of T hot. And so now, we're going to move at a constant volume, which is to say, um, uh, we're going to go from the hot temperature down to the cold temperature at a constant volume. And so we're going to do this. We're going to go in this direction. And so when we do that, we're going to, um, that's called uh, ugh, isochoric, an isochoric uh, move through our system here. 
So then what we're going to do is start at t cold at point, you know, this point down here, point 3. Um, that was point 2, by the way. And then we are going to proceed along t cold and decrease our volume from, we'll call this v2 and p2, back to v1 and some other pressure. And that's point 4. And we're going to call this part C. And so this is an isothermal system, or this is an isothermal path through our PV diagram, where now, instead of increasing our volume, we're decreasing our volume. And then the final step of this is going back to point one with another isochoric uh, process. So we're keeping the constant volume and increasing the pressure. So we're going from a cold temperature to a hot temperature. And we're going to call that D. And now we can work out uh, how much work has been done and how much heat goes in and out. And let's talk about the heat issue first. So first off, when we're going to through cycle A, our isothermal cycle down here, we are keeping a constant hot temperature as we're increasing the volume. And uh, going back to the ideal gas law, PV is equal to nRT, it's uh, as you increase the volume, you're going to have to put energy into the system to keep this working. So you're going to have to put heat in as we move clockwise around this. So this is moving from point 0.1 up here to 0.2 here. So we're going to go clockwise for the whole thing. So then uh, for part B, the isochoric de uh, decrease in pressure, well, uh, for the volume to stay a constant and the pressure to go down, we're going to have to take heat out. So I'm going to just draw an arrow pointing outward. For the, um, the isothermal uh, cycle or the isothermal process along T cold, well, we're going from a larger volume to a smaller volume, so we're compressing the gas. Um, so we're going to have to keep, we're going to have to take heat out to ensure that it stays at a constant temperature. And finally, here in D, we're going to have to go from a low pressure to a high pressure, which means that heat is going to have to go in. And so we see that we put heat in here in process A and in process D. We, put, we take heat out here in process B and process C. And so uh, there is going to be heat flowing in and out of the system. We know that there's going to be work done during parts of this. We know that here we have a change in volume, so that work being the integral of PdV means there's going to be work done. And the work is, for A, it's going to be positive work because the volume is going from a small value to a larger value, and pressure is always positive. Um, in B, this isochoric process, the volume does not change, so no work is done, but heat is lost. Here, in C, we're going from a large volume to a small volume, so volume is decreasing, so negative work is done by the gas. And then over here, we go again at an isochoric process, we go from a low pressure to a high pressure, but don't change the volume, so no work is done. So now what we're going to do is calculate the work. And since work is just equal to the integral of PdV, we can tell that for B and D, no work is done. And that's just again because there's no volume change. So for part A, this is isothermal. So we know that the work is going to be the integral of PdV. And so we're going to write that as W is the integral of P dV, and we know from our expression for an isothermal gas, P is just equal to nRT over V, so this is going to be equal to, for the gas that we're dealing with right now, nRT over V dV, specifically for isothermal, and we're going from volume 1, which is a small volume, to volume 2, which is a large volume. And in this case, specifically, the temperature is T hot, which I'm going to write down as TH. And so everything but 
the volume is a constant in this, and so it's going to be equal to n r t hot integral of dv over v from v1 to v2. And we know that when we integrate this, that this is going to be equal to, uh, you know, when we integrate dv over v, we're going to get log v. So the work done by process A, the isothermal process, is going to be nr t hot times the natural log of v2 divided by v1. And this is going to be um, positive because v2 is greater than v1. And similarly, we can work out the work done for part C, which is also isothermal. And in this case, we're going from V2 to V1 at a temperature of T cold. And so what we can do is just write down the work done by C, and that's going to be equal to NR T cold times the natural log of V1 over V2. And that's important to note, is that it's the volume that we start out at, V2, to the volume that we end at, V1. And if you compare that to the work done at part A of our cycle, it's going to be the opposite of this. And so that is actually uh, a really useful uh, thing to note because we know that the log of, you know, call it A over B, is equal to minus the log of B over A. And this is just a, a fundamental property of logarithms. And so the work done in part C of our cycle is going to be minus nRT cold times the log of V2 over V1. And so now we can uh, write everything down. So now let's calculate the total work. We know that the total work is going to be the total work done by the isothermal process A along the hot isotherm plus the isochoric process B going from hot to cold plus the isothermal process C at, temperature, at the cold temperature going to a smaller volume and then the isochoric process D uh, going from low pressure to high pressure at V1. And so we know that the isochoric processes don't do any work. So we know that these two are equal to zero. And then we can just write down, using what we just figured out for the isothermal processes, what the work done is by them, which is just this expression here. And so recall that this is the log of V2 over V1, and this is the log of V1 over V2. And I should write down that that is an actual log in there. I apologize for that. Um, so now what we can do is rewrite this using that relationship for logarithms that I was talking about before. And now I've done that. And all that's happened here is that I have inverted the logarithm, and now I have a minus sign. And so this allows me to combine the two pieces of this equation into something that's a little bit more expressive, which is this expression right here. And what we see is that the total work done let's write this so it's a little bit more obvious that it's a W, the total work done is just equal to NR times the difference between the hot and the cold temperature times the log of V2 over V1. And so this tells you that in order to get as much work as possible out of this system, you either want the temperatures to be as different as possible or the volumes to be as different as possible or both. And in general, when we're talking about mechanical systems like automobiles, um, the volumes or the change in volume isn't necessarily huge. So we aim to have really large changes in temperature. And that's actually uh, sort of more efficient anyway because the work done goes linearly with delta T, but it goes logarithmically with the change in the volume or the increase in the volume. And it's also important to note that we, we also discussed heat flowing in and out. And so the total work that's done is going to be equal to the heat put in, and this is all done um, during step A, minus the heat that went out in step C. And so 
uh, step B and step D, which are the isochoric processes, exactly cancel each other out um, because uh, you have to put in, to go from one isotherm to the other for a constant amount of gas, you have to put in or take out exactly the same amount of gas. I'm sorry, I meant to say exactly the same amount of heat. So, let's recap. A and C are isothermal processes. That means that in this, work is done because you're changing in volume. You're either increasing in volume or decreasing in volume. B and D are isochoric processes. And since you're at a constant volume, either decreasing or increasing, then the work done is equal to zero. The total work done in this system is just going to be equal to nR times T hot minus T cold times the natural log of V2 over V1. And that also happens to be equal to Q in minus Q out. And that is because energy is conserved. Um, our system returns to its original state uh, when we go around clockwise starting here. It starts at 1 and it ends at point 1. And so the total work done, since we're returning to the same physical place, just has to be equal to the heat put in minus the heat taken out. So the net, you know, the, the net, uh, the net heat exchanged. I would also note that uh, we can do both positive and negative work. And so if we go clockwise around this system, then what we're going to do is positive work. The work done by the gas is greater than zero. And so that means that Q in minus Q out is greater than zero. And so in other words, to do positive work, for the gas to do positive work, you have to put in more heat, in, you have to put more heat into the gas than you take out. Now you can also do the same thing that we just did in this derivation uh, except you go the other way around the cycle, and you can go counterclockwise. And what you see is that the work done by the gas is actually less than zero, and which means that whatever the gas, uh, whatever your system, your, uh, your Stirling engine is connected to, is actually doing network on it instead of it doing network, instead of your Stirling engine doing network on its environment. And in that case, Q in minus Q out is also going to be less than zero. Um, however, remember that we just did this, this first one. So this is what we did in the video, and you can reverse it to do the other one. So, thank you very much.